it's about the political climate we live in now and that if we're united, we can change things. Most legislators count on uh, teachers' altruistic nature. We can rely on them to do more with less, and that's been going on for far too long. The Teacher Leader Program, it's fantastic. It is a great opportunity for teachers to feel like they have a voice and a place. Being a, a teacher at a charter school that's organized, that's unionized, that's empowered to make the school better, we do. Just like you're hearing in the background, what side are you on? Are you on the side of public education? The way I see it now, our country is in chaos. So we need a, a president that we can count on, a person who's not going to throw tantrums. And I'm glad the AFT provided us this opportunity so we can hear firsthand about uh, the issues that are facing us. Really lucky to be part of a union that uh, democratizes that power and lets us come and have our voices heard. to use my teacher voice? <laughs> my name is Evelyn De Jesus, and I am, I am the Vice President for Education of the AST's largest local, the United Federation of Teachers in New York City. But just two days ago, in one of the greatest moments of my life, the AFT Executive Council elected me to serve as the Executive Vice President of the Amer American Federation of Teachers. It is also one of my proudest moments because I am the first Latina to serve in our union's top leadership. represent all the members of this union to advocate for the rights of educators, healthcare professionals, and public employees across the country in our fight for a better life and a voice at work and a voice in our democracy. It seems fitting that my first official act in my new role is to speak at this conference, teach. Being here with you, being here with you these last few days has energized me, which is kind of scary because I'm like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> People that know me could tell you that. Has energized me and helped me get ready for my new role. I hope you've had, I hope all of you have had much fun. Have you had fun? Yeah. Have you learned anything? Yeah. And have you been inspired? Yeah. Because I'm inspired. So back in April, our President Randy Weingarten gave a speech at the National Press Club about the crisis in our profession, a crisis driven by disinvestment and deprofessionalization. In true Randy's fashion, she didn't just point out the problem, she laid out solutions. And that's why the AFT is fighting to fund our future and for the freedom to teach. How many are with us? Like, that was like very weak. How many are energized and inspired? Let's go. That's it. So you probably know that Randy is a road warrior. She crisscrosses the country to attend countless school visits, meetings, forums, town halls, to be with many of you and many of our members as humanly possible. She heard firsthand how demoralizing it is when teachers are denied the freedom to teach, and how affirming it is when teachers can exercise the freedom to teach. 
Many of us have joined the AFT's Freedom to Teach community on Share My Lesson, sharing smart ideas and sobering stories about teaching and learning conditions, voice and agency, and the opportunity to collaborate. So when our wonderful partners at Donors Choose, which is donorschoose.org, to give them a plug, gave us the opportunity to award some credits on their amazing website, we wanted them to go to the best ideas about the freedom to teach. From people giving a part of their summer, so these guys gave a part of their summer to join us here at our conference. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to announce the winners of our awards. So, so please come and join me on stage as I call your name. Candidate number one. And I, you know, let's hear it up, okay? Emily Griswold. <laughs> Stephanie Gunderson. <laughs> Mary Clay Flores. <laughs> Mariah Watts. <laughs> Terry Kennedy. <laughs> Marjorie Pita. <laughs> Dana Swanson. Caitlin Peckering, <laughs> Jennifer Sermian. And I just want you to know that they got $1,000 from Donors Choose. So let's give it up for Donors Choose. One minute. Teachers are professionals. We understand what our students need. I think if teachers got involved and voted and people with like-minded interests, working people in general, we can get who we need elected. Get some funding too. Hello teachers and members of AFT. I'm Kirsten Gillibrand and the first thing I want teachers to know about me is how truly grateful I am for the work you do. They say it takes a village to raise a child, but teachers don't get enough support for the above and beyond work you do to educate, empower, and care for our nation's kids. That's why, as president, I will always fight to ensure teachers receive the pay they deserve, fully funding special ed at 50%, giving educators the support, resources, and small class sizes they need, and the benefits that they've already earned. I'll also reinvest in community programs to ensure students are receiving the care they need inside and outside of the classroom so our teachers can focus on shaping the minds of our next generation. Thank you for all that you do. I'm so proud to stand with you. I know you're trying to do town halls with all the candidates. I do a town hall with a teacher every single night, so I think I win this competition, okay? I'm a congressman. I'm running for president. I'm here to listen. The mandates from the federal government are really tying our hands. We'll never be able to get better because our funds are being pulled. If we don't begin to build... Hi, I'm Tim Ryan. I want you to know as teachers that my wife is a first grade uh, school teacher in a public school in our community. Our three kids all go and attend public schools and I'm going to be committed as your president to be the education president, to focus on trauma-based care, social and emotional learning, play therapy. We've got to deal with the trauma and the adverse childhood experiences that our kids are going through every single day. We can do this together. Join my campaign. Thank you. We support the candidates that support us, our daily lives, the workforce of this country. That's what matters. Not the top 1%, not the big corporations. No, real people like you and me. 
Hi, I'm Governor Jay Inslee, and as a son of an educator, I want to thank you for your work. You know, in my state of Washington, we've put billions of more dollars in schools. We've lowered class sizes. I'm particularly proud that I've achieved the largest average increase in educator compensation in the United States, and we now have the best financial aid package for college students. Uh, these are the priorities I want to take to the White House. Hope you look at our plan at jayinslee.com. Let's keep this ball rolling. Teachers need to inform their community members. They need to be really active. And I'm a government teacher, and I fully believe that you have to vote. The only time that things change is when people are uncomfortable, and then when people are uncomfortable, they have to stand up and do something about it. And the easiest, most basic thing you can do is show up to vote. I'm at the Sunflower County Freedom Project in Mississippi. I just spent an hour with a group of middle school and high school students talking to me about their concerns for our country. But I wanted to take time out from that awesome session to say, Greetings, AFT Teach. Thank you for taking time from your summer to attend AFT Teach as you work to offer the promise of a future to the next generation of Americans. Having worked side by side with nearly 5,000 teachers as superintendent of Denver Public Schools, I witnessed our teachers' professional and personal commitment and passion to change the lives of their students. And, and I know you strive every day to give the kids in your classroom the best education possible. Like you as superintendent, I went to sleep each night thinking about our students, and I got up the next morning thinking about them too. That's how I start every day as a senator, and as president, I do the same. As a nation, it's high time we recognize, support, and pay teachers like they're responsible for our future, because you are. A great teacher for every classroom, a great school for every child, pre-K through higher ed, that's the single best way to level the playing field and bring back the American dream that is out of reach for far too many. Thanks for all that you do. My students often live in substandard housing, lack appropriate medical care, have experienced trauma. What's very important is that I advocate and that I advocate not just for my students, but for my colleagues as well. As a member of the union, I'm going to speak up. We need to fund our future so that we know our students can be college and career ready. Hello, terrific teachers. You know, great students are a direct subsidiary of wonderful teachers. That's why what you do is so incredibly important. And that's why as president, I will support you every day to make sure your work is valued, you get the resources you need, and that together, we turn K through 12 into pre-K through 14, that every young person gets pre-K as a basic right of public education, and that they get something after high school, either community college or career and technical training as part of public education. We can do this together. We can make sure we're investing in our schools and our teachers, and that we continue to build the best public education system in the world. Good evening, good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Yasmin Arrington. I am a proud product of DC Public Schools. <laughs> and I could not have been as successful as I have become if it were not for the amazing, passionate teachers and administrators I had through grade school and college who took the time to invest in me with their time, talents, instruction, advice, and wisdom both inside and outside of the classroom. I am a Peace First Prize recipient, a Jack Kent Cooke Foundation Scholar alumna, and a College Success Foundation Scholar alumna. In 2010, I founded the nonprofit Scholar Chips for children of incarcerated parents which provides college scholarships, mentorship, and a support network to youth who have incarcerated parents and are pursuing their college degree. Thank you, I love the energy. <laughs> when I was a junior in high school, I was challenged to identify a social issue in my community and come up with a creative solution to that problem. I learned that over 2.7 million youth in the United States have an incarcerated parent like I did, and I knew I needed scholarships to help me afford a college tuition. But I could not find any scholarship programs in my region for students like me, so I decided to start scholarships. To date, scholarships has awarded over $150,000 to 61 scholars. <clears throat> 
I would like to share with you a few of the characteristics that my teachers and professors exhibited that contributed to my holistic su success, both inside and outside of the classroom. One, even if they were frustrated or tired, my teachers always spoke to me with kindness, patience, and respect. Two, they were always willing to answer my questions. Three, they encouraged my curiosity. Four, they referred me to other opportunities for leadership, to run for SGA, recruited me for school sports teams, casted me in school plays, referred me to education advancement opportunities, and wrote me amazing recommendation letters. Five, they used positive affirmations like, great job, Yasmeen. You can do this, Yasmeen. You are smart, Yasmeen. Six, they opened up their classrooms to me to come after hours to study, ask questions, or hang out. And seven, they were passionate about their topics, and they taught in creative ways to help us to learn and remember the material. I will always and forever be eternally grateful to my teachers and professors for that. And thank you for all that you do for our children and youth across the country. You do make a difference. Please, please learn more about scholarships, donate, and get involved by visiting www.scholarchipsfund.org. That is www.scholarchipsfund.org. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Hi, my name is Tony Weaver Jr. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about heroes today, which is a big surprise to everybody, I'm sure. Um, uh, I have always been in love and enamored with the idea of heroes. An extraordinary person uh, with the ability to create great change. Uh, now, most of the time when we think of heroes, we think of people like wearing capes, or like Spider-Man swinging through the skies. But for me growing up, uh, the first hero uh, that I encountered was my mom, uh, who uh, I I'm sure... <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm sure my mom would like all of you all a lot uh, because she started her career as a public school math teacher in DeKalb County, Georgia. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, my mom started out uh, as a math teacher, advanced to assistant principal, principal, and is now a regional superintendent of one of the largest school districts in the state of Georgia. Um, and I say all that to say uh, that I understand teachers because uh, I was raised by one. So words such as responsibility, rigor, grit, perseverance uh, were things that were hammered into me from the moment I started walking into a classroom. Uh, my mom always loved the idea of challenges, and she always wanted me to be challenged academically. So I went from uh, high achievers program to gifted program to magnet program uh, until I attended a school where I encountered a challenge that was not an academic one. Uh, in my mom's uh, eagerness uh, for me to be academically stimulated, I went from a school about 15 minutes from my house uh, to a school that took me about two hours to get to each morning uh, where I was one of the only black students in my class. Um, and while I was there, uh, what I encountered, uh, even though I showed up and wanted to be a hero, uh, was a world that was a little bit different. Uh, I wanted to be cool, like Ash from Pokemon, but it was really hard for me to make friends. Um, I wanted to be smart, like Robin, uh, but when I would submit papers to my teachers, uh, I'd get notes back that said, hey, did you write this? Plagiarism is wrong. Talk to me after class. As much as I wanted to be powerful, I felt powerless. Uh, and in middle school, it led me to a point where I attempted to take my own life. In that time, uh, what brought me out of that dark place uh, was not uh, my parents. It wasn't my teachers. Uh, it wasn't my friends. It was comic books. It was superheroes. Uh, having the opportunity to read these stories of these amazing characters uh, that had these challenges that seemed insurmountable sometimes, work past them, 
gave me the courage to continue going at a time when I didn't think my life had value. Uh, at that time, I thought it was a me problem. I thought it was an individual problem. Um, my mom moved me to a school that was a lot closer to home where I had smaller class sizes. I graduated salutatorian in my high school class uh, and got a really large scholarship to attend Elon University. <laughs> I attended Elon University in North Carolina uh, with the idea that I could study acting and become the next Denzel Washington. <laughs> uh, however, when I got there, I encountered something that changed my path a little bit. Uh, as a part of one of my classes, I volunteered at a local elementary school where I mentored a black male fourth grader named Nazir. Uh, now, I was supposed to be a friendly face that wasn't a teacher uh, to help Nazir with any curriculum-related issues that he was having. However, every time we spoke, he only wanted to talk to me about superheroes and cartoons, <laughs> uh, how much he loved them and how much he wanted to be like them. Uh, Halloween was coming up, and when I asked him if he was going to dress as his favorite superhero, he told me, uh, I can't because I don't look like him. I'm going to dress as CJ from Grand Theft Auto. Uh, because in the fourth grade, when he had to think about who he could be, uh, the first thing that came to mind was the main character of a video game where you kill people, steal things, and run away from police. And that experience with Nazir made me realize something, that I wasn't alone. And after doing some research, I found that we weren't alone either. Uh, the average American student spends about 10 and a half hours a day engaging with media content. However, according to a study done by Stanford University, over 80% of them are not equipped with the tools in order to parse through the stereotypes and images that they're seeing. Uh, with that in mind, I started an organization called Weird Enough Productions, uh, where we use superheroes and comic books to bring literacy and social emotional learning uh, to middle and high school students through our educational program. As educators, I'm sure all of you all are aware of the problems that our world faces today. Uh, and that there is something that needs to happen. There's a change that needs to come. Uh, however, my core belief is that the cavalry is not coming. The heroes that we need are not suddenly going to swoop in from the sky. Uh, they exist in the hearts of every young person that sits in every classroom around this country every day. Uh, so with that in mind, I started Weird Enough with our educational program, Get Media Lit, uh, with this idea that they are heroes uh, in all of us. And what I want to leave you all at with as teachers today is that there is a hero in every young person that you get to teach every day uh, and encouraging you to pour into them and let them wear their capes. Whether that's a real cape like mine or uh, an art brush, uh, a tablet, uh, a blog, a uh, social justice hashtag, equip your students for success. And I would really appreciate if you all uh, gave us a look at getmedialit.com. Thank you. Before starting her new school in Dearborn, Michigan, 12-year-old Nabila was worried. Because I don't know any one, I don't know the language they talk, and I think they are going to laugh about me. New immigrants like Nabila have a lot to cope with when they get to middle school. Many students here have seen terrible things in their home country. Anytime there was a loud noise, this poor little kindergarten boy would just hit the floor and he would cry because where he came from, there were bombs. You'll notice a lot of the students don't have their moms here. How do teachers make these kids feel safe so they can learn? I think if you make that personal connection with those kids, you know, and they know who to turn to when they need to turn to someone. Good morning, beautiful children. Are you ready to learn? Yeah! The Dearborn Public School District has figured out that intensive professional development in language instruction and culturally responsive practice can make a big difference in helping immigrant students succeed. 
It's about good teaching. It's about focused instruction. It's about providing them the kind of environment that they need. Most of all, it's about believing in them. The teachers union has been an important partner in helping these students thrive. I learned very quickly about the variety of needs for, for um, these kids and how important it was to, to be able to meet them so that they could be successful. This effort starts from the moment families walk through the front door. All right, have a super duper Danny. To be the first face that they see, I can immediately see uh, some relief on their faces. They feel like they're in a place that they belong versus yet another strange place. Brothers Hussein and Yusuf Kadi came to America because of the war in their home country of Yemen. Their mother had to stay behind. I was, I was mad because my mom was at, still at Yemen and it wasn't um, that fun and I missed her. I cried all the time. Yusuf, he was saying, oh my God, where's my mom? Tell him he's gonna come, he's gonna come. That's hard for him and us too. When I said, how was it like when you first came to the United States, he said, I was sad. I wow. miss my mom so much. I said, really, Yusuf? It's fact, Ms. Zalhaiki, because we are working for Michigan Tech. It's fact. Yusuf's mom finally did join the family. Now Yusuf is reading above grade level in English. Kualalu thought about the times when her mother... Leaving a country, you were born there, your roots are there, it's not easy at all. So when they come here, the minimum we can do, give them this, this attention, this love, this care. You know, they come every day, they're ready, um, bright-eyed, they ask a hundred questions, and then I just, I know that what I'm doing is so impactful to them. <laughs> Dearborn is giving children the chance to dream of a happier life. It starts with a simple message. Dear students, you are important. You are listened to. I support you. You are in a safe place. Love, Miss Alhaiki. Love, love, Miss Alhaiki. everyone. My name is Diane L. Wabi and I'm an English language development specialist. <laughs> In my beautiful city of Dearborn, we've had an influx of refugee families. The excerpt you just watched was created by Color in Colorado with cooperation from my local union and school system. It is a beacon of light amidst continuing anti-immigrant rhetoric in our country. Hate crimes against Muslims in the United States and abroad such as the arson of mosques and violence against individuals identifiable as Muslim. As this video highlights, our public schools are the cornerstone for welcoming immigrant communities into the fold. This is what America is about. My role enables me to provide my students with intense literacy instruction, co-teach in classrooms with large numbers of newcomers, and provide professional development for my staff. Yet that is just one piece of the learning puzzle. My newcomer students walk into our building, shoulders slumped and eyes are glazed. Rightfully so, they are afraid of the unknown. As educators, our job encompasses many different roles, from social workers to nurses. It is our job to make sure all our students feel like they belong. They must know that we are personally invested in them and their success. I have made it my business to know as much as I can about all my students. I know that my class clown, Ahmad, talks to his younger stepsister in New York daily. I know that my quiet Tayyiba is very excited that there will be a new addition to her family this summer. I know that my sweet Kahlan's parents are overseas and he is under the care of his older brother, who is balancing high school and an after-school job as a busboy. Kahlan visits me in the community center until 5, then he heads to the mosque, where his brother picks him up after his shift at 11. I know that my wise Wahhabi helps support his family by doing odd jobs. His mother, like many of my students' parents, is overseas and her visa is taking longer than expected. Most of my students have fled their home because of war, yet all of them have come to this country with a positive outlook on their future. I admire them for their strong will and conviction, 
They inspire me to be a better educator, a better mother, and ultimately a better human. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nuria Ahmed, and I'm a child accounting secretary at Salina Elementary School in Dearborn, Michigan. That clip shows just a little of how we work with immigrant kids and their families so they feel truly integrated into their school and community. I hope you'll go to colorincolorado.org to watch the whole video and check out the other amazing ELL resources on the site. My parents were immigrants from Yemen. I was born and raised here in the United States. In elementary school, I quickly realized that I wasn't the only one getting an education. My parents were as well. They didn't speak English. My older siblings and I had to translate everything for them. Now, I work in a school that is over 95% ELL. Families arrive from overseas as a whole. Sometimes, children come into the US without either parent. None of them speak English, and this reminded me of my younger days. When I was translating for my own parents, I knew I had to be that bridge again. When people can communicate in their native language, they feel appreciated and know someone is listening and understanding them. This appreciation strengthens their confidence and turns into an opportunity for them to be an active partner in their child's education. The goal of having school and home working together is very important to achieve. I love to go above and beyond to make sure families feel welcome and that their children feel safe. My role is only the beginning of their wonderful journey that continues right into the classroom with highly effective, well-qualified teachers and throughout our school under the leadership of our principal. Additionally, our district superintendent forms community and professional partnerships and collaborations that help us all achieve and celebrate success together. And all the while, this is the work of union members like me. I'm thrilled that Dearborn Public Schools was featured and the stories of some of our students were shared so that others can learn from them. Thank you, and on behalf of our Arabic-speaking ELL population, shukran. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Minnesota Commissioner of Education and former AFT Executive Vice President, Mary Catherine Ricker. What a privilege it is to be here with all of you. So many educators and friends with whom I have shared so much through the years. And to be here with you after the 2018 elections that literally changed my life uh, when Governor Tim Walz and Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan asked me to leave AFT and join their administration as Minnesota's Education Commissioner. Well, it is a privilege to be here and to have the opportunity to say congratulations to Evelyn and to thank you. Randy, Loretta, and Evelyn, I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak one last time. This is not the trajectory I anticipated when I earned my teaching license in 1991. But here's what I know about teaching. Historically, and too often in our own experiences, teaching has been an isolating profession. Too many of us see ourselves without support in our classrooms, trying on our own to figure out how to reach and teach our students, come up with lesson plans, try new ideas. But the fundamental lesson of civics education, that democracy thrives in solidarity, exists in education too. Strong teaching thrives in solidarity. You don't have to think that it's up to you alone to break down the barriers to teaching and learning. Because the truth 
that I learned from mentors as an early career educator, that I learned from colleagues who supported me while I earned my national board certification, or that I learned from the paraprofessionals and administrators I taught alongside, is that I was not alone. You are not alone. There are your colleagues in your building, in your district, in your country. From those parking lot lesson exchanges we've all been a part of, to internet-based formal lesson sharing, or that cohort model for pursuing national board certification. Any professional atmosphere of teaching and learning deliberately includes sharing ideas that work, as well, and maybe especially, as those ideas that don't. And there are the communities and families we serve. One of the first things I heard as Minnesota's education commissioner as I crossed the state meeting people is that the vast majority of community members want our public schools to succeed and they want to support our students. They want to know how to help and they want to know what support they can provide alongside us. A professional atmosphere of teaching thrives in authentic collaboration with families. Looking beyond the five-minute parent-teacher cattle call conferences and intentionally building in opportunities to listen, listen to each other so we will better meet the needs of our students together. And there are your students we are never alone in a classroom. A professional atmosphere of teaching and learning sees our students as assets with whom we are co-creating a safe and welcoming environment to meet their academic needs. Here's where Chris Emden's focus on creating a truly inclusive classroom is essential. Given the beautiful cross-section of the world in our public school classrooms, the safe and welcoming environment we must insist on demands an inclusive classroom in which every student is safe, valued, supported, and seen. And as our next speaker, Mark Brackett, is going to show us, the more we can equip our students with the tools to strengthen and practice their social and emotional intelligence, the more accessible we will make our academic expectations. When we commit to meet the academic needs of our students alongside the social and emotional needs of our students in a safe and welcoming environment and when we realize there are colleagues, families, community members, and leaders alongside us in our professional communities, we will more powerfully, more authentically, and more effectively meet the needs of our students. I am not saying it is always easy to remember, especially when responsibilities fall solely on you. 5 a.m., writing subplans after the unmistakable sound of one of your children getting sick. Or watching any sort of weather from your part of the country rolling in that is going to force you how to figure out how to deliver five days of education, five days worth of teaching, in the last three days of the semester you now have because school has been canceled. Or the five lesson plans you need to review by 7 a.m. as a consulting teacher supporting novice teachers in your peer assistance and review program. I am not pretending there are not a lot of responsibilities that are uniquely yours at any given moment. I am asking you to remember that strong teaching and learning 
that that professional atmosphere thrives in solidarity. So when you are feeling isolated in the moment, that is when you make your plan to be with your community at the next possible opportunity, the colleagues you can gather, the families you can work alongside, the community you can call on, or the education commissioner you can call to work alongside you. Together, we will create the academic expectations our students deserve. Together, we will create the social and emotional conditions our students deserve. Together, we will create the safe and welcoming climates our students deserve. I want to thank you for your warmth, for your welcome, for your energy, and especially thank you for your commitment to the students and the families of our public schools. Thank you. It is, it is now my privilege to introduce and welcome to the stage Yale professor and director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, Mark Brackett. Mark is on the board of directors for, collaborative, for the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, also known as CASEL. He is also the lead developer of RULER, a systemic evidence-based approach to social and emotional learning used by over 2,000 schools across the country. Please join me in welcoming Mark Brackett. Thank you. Thank you. Oh boy, I think I have the hardest job of this whole conference. I have to close it. And I think I'm going to have to start by asking you all an obvious question. How are you feeling? Right, that's a nonverbal example. Um, so we're going to take a nice long inhale, please. And a nice long exhale. And I know that a lot of you are, like me, getting ready to um, leave. Uh, and I know that your brains are probably activated with, am I going to get a taxi in time? And am I going to get to the airport? And I got other things I got to do. And I'm going to tell you, don't think about it, um, which is biologically impossible. So I'm going to give you some strategies. What I'd like you to do first is think about this quote. Just take a moment. And I'll read it for you. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. How does that resonate with you now that you've been at this conference for two or three days? What comes to mind for you and your role as educational leader? What I find interesting about this is that um, I teach at a university where the only thing people care about is what you know. And I even have students tell me things like, you know, Professor Brackett, I didn't need emotional intelligence to get in. And I'm going to say, but you're going to need it to get out. Um, and I mean that pretty seriously. So with that said, may I ask all of you to take a look at this little chart. This is our tool we call the Mood Meter. It's based in a lot of science. And I'm going to do the two-minute version of this. Right now, all of you are feeling something. On the x-axis, it says the word pleasantness. Minus five in pleasantness, you're thinking to yourself, when is this guy going to be done? I want out. I can't take it anymore. I'm saturated. I'm at the end of my rope. Is anybody there? <laughs> no one's going to admit it, right? <laughs> Minus three in pleasantness, you're saying things to yourself like, this is what they're ending the conference with? Some guy talking about feelings? There's something drastically wrong with the AFT. Maybe you're neutral. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, I could be here listening to Mark. I could be in my classroom. I could be with my family. What's the difference? <laughs> Maybe you're at plus three in pleasantness right now. You're thinking to yourself, my goodness, a guy up front here talking about feelings for 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe you're at plus five in pleasantness. You're looking at me and thinking to yourself something like, I want this guy to move in. Like, I want to wake up next to Mark every morning so I can just, you know, he can 
share with me how he's feeling and we can have that rich conversation. <laughs> so you're probably somewhere between that extreme, which I may get fired for saying, <laughs> and maybe the most unpleasant. On the y-axis, all of you have some level of energy right now. Minus five would mean that you're so low in energy, you're like the Wicked Witch in The Wizard of Oz after the water, and she's disappearing into the ground. Plus five, you have more energy than you can even contain. I'm getting no sense of that, just so you know. <laughs> and now we put these things together and we create our mood meter tool. Let me get a raise of hands. How many of you are somewhere in the yellow, high energy and pleasant? All right, not enough of you. <laughs> How many of you are in the green? You're pleasant, but your energy is kind of low. All right. Anybody in the blue or the red right now? A little bit. All right, we've got a few honest people. Notice that we're laughing that people are feeling unpleasant, but uh, a time will tell. So what I'm going to ask you right now to do is not think about yourself, but take a moment and think about the daily life of a student in your school. I don't care if it's preschool, elementary, middle, or high school. And I want you to imagine their day from the moment they wake up in the morning. I know I'm sitting here staring at my friends from New York City where we're working with about 350 of the schools, 1.1 million children, 10% of whom are living in temporary housing or homelessness. How are they feeling when they wake up in the morning? What are they looking at? Who are they talking with? How are they commuting to school? When they enter school and they look around, how do they feel? Class one, class two, class three, how do the students in your school feel at 10 o'clock in English language arts or math or science? How about lunchtime? What's going on at lunch? How are they feeling there? Afternoon classes, commute home or after school program, evening. So that's an area of research that I've been very interested in over the last couple of years. And here are some studies. The first one is with 22,000 high school students across the United States of America, public, private, and charter schools, poor schools, and rich schools. And what we found in this research is that about 75% of the words our nation's high schoolers use to describe their emotional lives in school are negative. Tired, stressed, and bored are the top three. Just take a moment and digest that. Tired, bored, and stressed. When I went more granular in the data, what I found was there were certain things that influenced their emotions, specific emotions. For example, children who were like me, who experienced a lot of bullying, meanness and cruelty, they're feeling fearful and hopeless. Take a moment and think about that. How many of you believe that the feelings of fear and hopelessness are ideal for creativity and innovation? No, of course not. It's interesting, when I think back about my own childhood, I was a failing student in middle school, C and D student. And I know you're thinking to yourself, how is that possible? This guy's brilliant. Um, <laughs> the truth is, I am really freaking smart. Um, <laughs> but when you're being bullied and you're living your daily life feeling fear and hopelessness, guess what? Your brain is not available to you for learning. It's just biologically not possible. Your brain is in fight or flight mode. Your brain is in saying, how do I get out of here safely? Who's going to be my friend? Am I going to get hurt again today? It's just basic neuroscience. But on the good side of things, students who report having positive relationships, students who report having highly engaging instruction, and very importantly, students who report being in classrooms where learning is made relevant and meaningful to their personal goals, they're the ones who are having the most pleasant experiences. I'm very interested in our LGBTQI students. And what we found in our research, as you might predict, is these are the students who are having the most difficulties in our schools. It's two to three times as much anxiety and depression as our heterosexual students and gender cis students. From sexual orientation to gender identity, the more diverse you are, the more unpleasant your emotional life is as a student. Think about these data. Anxiety disorder is the most common mental illness in the United States. About 25% of our nation's adolescents have an anxiety disorder right now. And the list goes on, from depression being the leading cause of disability to something that is just unbelievably troublesome, is that the suicide rate in our country has gone up by 28% in the last 17 years. 
When you think about bullying and assaults, the data are very clear. I just wrote a paper analyzing the world of bullying prevention. Bullying has flatlined. It has not gone down in over 20-something years. As a matter of fact, in the last two years, it is seemingly increasingly going up. As a matter of fact, one recent study showed that cyberbullying has gone up 35% just in the last two years. As a matter of fact, another study done by the Anti-Defamation League has shown a 100% increase in reports for racial and other kinds of discrimination reports. So we're not in a good place. Let's look at our teachers. As you can see, they're doing great. Uh, this is you, by the way. These are not made up data. So I know all of you are the chosen ones, but when we interviewed 6,000 teachers in this study across the United States and asked them, how do you feel as a teacher in your school each day? Guess what we found? The top feeling was frustration. It gets even more interesting. What we found was the single strongest predictor of their negative emotions had to do with the culture and climate of their school. The relationships between and among their leaders, their colleagues, and their students and parents. And interestingly enough, look at those outcomes. So think about this. Teachers who are in more unpleasant climates experience more negative emotions each day. And look at the outcomes. More burnout, more stress-related absences, having sleeping troubles, even higher body mass indexes, and greater anxiety and depression. So we need to think about the emotional lives of our teachers. Would you agree? So we go to college students because we think, my goodness, if you get to go to college, you should feel pride and excitement and elation and accomplishment. Here are our nation's high school, I mean college students. As a matter of fact, in the state of Connecticut where I live, we have found that every year for the last six years, there has been a 20% increase. Let me repeat myself. Every year for the last six years, a 20% increase in college students seeking mental health treatment. I'll repeat myself, every year for the last six years, 20% increase is in students seeking mental health treatment. One of the strongest predictors, loneliness, isolation. Second predictor, living in envy. They're on social media saying, everyone else is better looking than I am, everyone else is more successful than I am. In classrooms, they're thinking that everyone's gonna be more successful than they are for whatever reason. Then we went to the workplace. And we said, all right, let's, you know, I can't deal with the whole education thing. Let's study people in the real world. So we got a grant and we studied 15,000 people across the United States who were farmers or working in finance. And guess what we found? They're stressed too. So the parents of our kids are stressed. Our teachers are frustrated and overwhelmed and stressed. The kids are tired, bored, and stressed. How many of you see that as a recipe for a future of amazing things happening in America? So if you go back to that mood meter that I introduced you to, it looks like we're emotionally out of balance, wouldn't you say? Yeah. We're spending way too much time in the red and blue and not enough time in that yellow and green. Now, I'm gonna be the first person to tell you the goal can't be to be in the yellow all the time. We have a, a thing in America, it's all about happiness, the pursuit of happiness, you know, the stumbling on happiness. There's so many books on happiness right now. Every time I read one, I get one point lower in my happiness. <laughs> I always joke, I'm a neurotic Jewish professor. I'm never gonna be happy, <laughs> right? Like, I, I'm, I'm striving for wellness. Like, can I just feel contentment on one day? If I had to wake up every morning and think, what do you need to be happy today? What do you need to be happy today? What do you need to be happy today? I think I would just be hospitalized. <laughs> Yet, when we ask people, how do you wanna feel? What do they say? Happy. My hunch is that it's because of our limited emotional vocabulary. That's what they know, it's a happy. Interestingly, when you pull happiness out, you get interesting words, you get appreciated, you get valued, you get supported, you get accomplished. Those are more meaningful. How many of you would like to feel more appreciated? How many of you would like to feel more valued? How many of you would like to feel more inspired and accomplished? Of course, we all want those emotions. Those are the ones that help us get up in the morning and want to get out of bed to go to work. So the center that I had the privilege of finding, or, or founding, is called the Center for Emotional Intelligence, and our goal is to use the power of emotions to create a healthier, more equitable, innovative, and compassionate society. 
And we do this because we know that emotions matter for five big reasons. The first is attention, memory, and learning. How you feel right now is driving your attentional capacity. If you're bored with my presentation, not only do I dislike you immensely, <laughs> uh, but your brain is somewhere else. Here's what we need to know about emotions. Boredom is a feeling. It's a real thing. And it doesn't mean you're doing nothing. It means that what is in front of you is not engaging and making you curious, and your brain has decided to do something else. So boredom is just a product of engagement. The second is decision making. Has anyone here ever made a bad decision? <laughs> Would anybody like to share publicly to just get it off their chest? <laughs> Go back to your freshman year in college? So we know that how teachers feel drives their decision making. Now this is a study that's not going to make you happy. So we did a study where we randomly assigned teachers to be in different mood states. It's very easy. Think about a good day, think about a bad day. We randomly assigned them. Good day, bad day, good day, bad day, good day, bad day. We wrote about it for five minutes. Thereafter, we gave every teacher the exact same essay to grade. Does anyone think there were differences in the grades that were assigned? You shouldn't be proud of that, by the way. <laughs> yes, when I'm in a bad mood, I give worse grades. That's a mental illness, just so you know. So this was a study where we randomly assigned them to be in different mood states. Lo and behold, what we found was one to two full grade differences immediately thereafter in terms of the evaluation of the student. When we asked the teachers at the end of the study, do you believe that how you felt had any influence over the way you evaluated the paper? 90% say no way. Like, why would how I feel have any influence over my evaluation? I'm feeling stuff all day long. How would that leak into my evaluation? What this tells us is that how we feel each day about ourselves, about our students, is guiding the way we interact. It's guiding the way we evaluate. One of the exercises we do in our training was we ask teachers to pull out your roster. What's the automatic feeling that you have for every student in your classroom? Is it love? Is it appreciation? Is it disgust? Is it hatred? Is it fear? And then take a moment and think about how that feeling influences your relationship, the feedback, the quality of that child's instruction. Because we know that emotions drive relationships. Does anyone here work with someone in their school who kind of makes these kinds of facial expressions? How many of you work with someone that does that frequently? <laughs> and how many of you say to yourself something like, I want to work with that person for the rest of my life? <laughs> no. Because emotions are signals to approach or avoid. We don't want to be around people that display a lot of negative emotions each day. Why could walk on eggshells? You've got to be careful what you say. Think about it. The fourth is physical and mental health. I'm going to say one thing about that. Right now, in our nation, our children have greater levels of stress and anxiety than the adults who are raising them. Finally, performance and creativity. Do you, how many of you value creativity? Innovation. Here's what I've learned over the years, that unless you have the strategies to deal with the difficulties in achieving creativity, you can't be creative. Because you get overwhelmed when you're trying to be creative. You get negative feedback. You get disappointed, you get overwhelmed, and if you don't have the strategies, it doesn't work out. I can't tell you how many times I'm doing presentations for superintendents of districts. I don't think this is the right approach for our school. And I'm thinking like, or I had one recently, I don't think I like it. I'm like, I don't think I like you. Not a problem. Like, <laughs> we don't have to work together, right? Not a problem. You can continue to damage kids in your district. No. Anyway, hey, I have a lot of courage these days because I know this is what our children need and I'm going to fight until the end. So, the question is, what are the skills? Like, what are the skills? And we spent a long time thinking about this. You've got to be able to identify your feelings. You've got to know how you're feeling. And it's not good or bad. 
There are 2,000 words in the English language dictionary that we could use to build greater awareness. It is my belief that every one of us in this room and every child has the fundamental right to be self-aware, to be aware of their inner life, to make meaning out of their inner life which means you have to understand what brings you to these places. Why am I angry? Why am I disappointed? Why am I frustrated? Why am I overwhelmed? That gives you access to the granular vocabulary. Then you're gonna know how to express and regulate. So let's go through that. Identifying emotions accurately in oneself and others. Paying attention to facial expressions, body language, vocal tones, our own physiology. Every emotion has a different pattern. Understanding these feelings. You know, even myself, I get confused. When I was going out for tenure, I had so much anxiety and, and fear, and I had, you know, I had 30 interviews, I had a proctologist was interviewing. I'm like, what does a proctologist have to do with my tenure? I don't get this. I was freaking out. I went to the doctor, and the doctor said to me, you know, this is what happens when you go out for tenure, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you your Prilosec for your heartburn, and I'm gonna give you your Ativan for your anxiety. I'm like, that's the treatment? <laughs> So I left there, best, and I started doing some self-reflection. I'm like, am I stressed? I don't know if I'm stressed, because stress has to do with, you know, not having the resources to meet the demands. I'm pretty resilient, so I wasn't stressed. Am I anxious? No, anxiety is about uncertainty. I feel pretty secure. I was overwhelmed. I was working 18-hour days. I wasn't giving myself any breaks to be with my family, to do my yoga. And I realized the only strategy that would work for me was to take things off my plate. Do you realize that's why you have to name it to tame it? Until you have that granularity and understanding of your feelings, it's really hard to know what to do with them. And that leads to the expression of emotion, knowing how and when to express our feelings. There are rules around this. There are cultural rules. There are family rules. There are racial rules, unfortunately. There are gender rules. Here's an example. So I have two brothers. They're doing fine in life. They're seven and 11 years older than I am. So by the time I was in like 10, 10 years old, they were both out of the house. They didn't really know what I do. They're convinced. My brother makes money thinking in coffee shops. And they're kind of right. Um, anyhow, I, uh, I invited my two brothers to hear me speak in New York City a couple years ago. And I was talking about my mom, who had a lot of anxiety problems, and my dad, who just told me, he said, Mark, you'll be a tough guy. Do I look like a tough guy? <laughs> I, never, I got a fifth degree black belt, actually. I'm still not a tough guy. Um, all these rules, I talked about my parents' strategies, which were alcohol and belts. I mean, it was a tough time for us. And so for the first 15 minutes of my talk, my brother was like, that's my brother. And then as soon as I started disclosing my bullying and my parents' issues, all of a sudden my brother's like this. <laughs> and I saw them, I was like freaking out looking. I'm like, I'm not gonna look at them for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> so after the talk was over, I went to my, I said, hey guys, like, what'd you think? And my one brother looks at me and he goes, don't walk out with us. I'm like, don't walk out with you? He's like, you share too much, it's embarrassing. I and mean, he, you shamed our family. And then my brother says, you know, and the more you start sharing, you know, Mark, the more people are going to think you're weak. <laughs> and I remember I said, Dave, like, I hate to tell you this, but like in my department, we call that projection, <laughs> right? Like, I'm doing okay. So it's all about the rules we create for ourselves. Would my brothers do better if they were in a little therapy? Yes. I didn't say that on video, though, did I? <laughs> it's all right. They haven't read my book yet. So, <laughs> emotion regulation is the last skill. This is the one that you will be working on for the rest of your life. So if you think you learned it in kindergarten or third grade or fifth grade or eighth grade or twelfth grade, or in teacher prep or in your graduate school program, I can tell you right now you're going to be working on it until your last breath. This is the hardest skill in the world to learn because why? It's a hot intelligence. It's that it's relationship driven and we can't predict how people are gonna interact with us and some days you're gonna deal with your anger well and other days you're gonna say mean and cruel things and you're gonna regret it and you're gonna have to apologize and you're gonna apologize and the person's gonna say, I don't like your apology. And you're gonna be like, I don't know what to do now. It's hard, hard work. 
It's about preventing unwanted emotions, reducing the difficult ones, even generating ones to do a presentation, to teach. It's about maintaining the pleasant ones that you want to hold on to when there are people in your life who are trying to steal your dreams. When I was doing a training in my good old state of Connecticut recently, this is what I heard from teachers. I remove my feelings before entering school. I'm like, you know nothing about psychology. <laughs> I put my feelings in a box. I also was in a school recently where a preschooler came to school after his father had walked into his bedroom that morning because the parents were going through divorce. And that little boy was told by his father the following. Your mother loves somebody else, and you're going to have a new daddy. And then the boy was dropped off at school that morning. Do you think that me telling this little boy, just, just put your feelings in a box? <laughs> think about that. It's not possible. Our feelings are with us throughout the day. We have to learn how to manage them. We have to learn how not to do harm to others. Because the truth is, for children in schools and in families, emotions are mostly co-regulated. Right? How I feel right now and the way I speak with you generates feelings within you. And then you have a choice. Do I want to feel this way? Do I not want to feel this way? How, do I feel safe with Mark, comfortable with Mark? Do I feel like, ooh? It's all about the feeling in the classroom. It's all about my facial expressions, my body language, my vocal tone. Leaders, teachers, students, families. It's, we're in this together. We're not isolated individuals. We are co-regulating each other on a daily basis. Unfortunately, we've learned all of these unhelpful strategies. So there are a number of good ones, by the way, like mindful breathing. Just so you know, it's not a religion. It's just breathing. <laughs> I don't know, some people are like, I can't do this in my school because it's a religious practice. I'm like, you were born breathing. <laughs> and you will breathe until you die. It's just breathing. Don't make a big deal out of it. Just breathe. And when you're like this, <laughs> slow it down. <laughs> Don't make it a complicated practice. You got to sleep. You got to eat. You got to move. You got to have good relationships. We know that. Do you know that in a study that I recently collaborated on, only 50% of teachers report having a positive individual relationship with every student in their classroom. And students in that classroom were interviewed, and only 34% agreed, which tells us two-thirds of our students say they don't have a caring adult that they feel they can go to when they have a problem. That doesn't require an expensive intervention, I hate to tell you. So let's go through these in more detail, especially the cognitive ones. So I ask yourselves, how compassionate are you to yourself? How much self-compassion do you have? I find that teachers are generally really great with supporting students. Don't worry, it's going to be OK. I'm here for you. But when they're freaking out, they don't use those same strategies, right? We use our negative self-talk. We, we kill ourselves by just saying mean and hurtful things to ourselves. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Our negative self-talk starts really early, like really early. Here's an example. I have an adopted niece from Guatemala. She is the most amazing high school student now. But I went with her single mom to Guatemala to help bring her here. And she's like my inspiration in life. But Esme was living in a state, in a city, that was a bit racially tense. And she was in school, in kindergarten. And another student said to her, you're a different color than your mother. Ew! To tell you that she was devastated would not be strong enough. Her whole world changed for her. Now her mom, who I know quite well, I would give her like a negative 100 on our scale of emotional intelligence. <laughs> so she calls me up and she goes, Mark, somebody bullied Esme in school. They said mean and hurtful things for her. She's starting to have really negative self-talk. I'm getting in my Jeep, and I'm going to run over that kid and her mother. <laughs> I'm done. And I'm like, all right, there are better strategies. <laughs> we're going to work on this together, because we're in this together. And I say that in all seriousness, we've got to be in this together. It took a couple of months to help Esme reprogram her thinking about herself. She had to realize that she has two uncles who are different colors. She doesn't have to believe everything that everybody says about her. 
Now, if she were her Uncle Mark, who's a professor of emotional intelligence, she might have said, who do you think you are to define my reality? Who do you think you are to try to put that negative soft talk in my brain? I am secure. But she was five. <laughs> right? So she didn't, we're not born with these strategies. They've got to be developed. They've got to be practiced. They've got to be refined. They have to be part of our education system. So there are a lot of things that we have to think about with healthy emotion regulation. A few things. It's got to be, it is effortful. It's developmental. It's specific to the emotion. It's got to be personalized. Because we have a very multicultural room here. Some people want hugs. Some people are uncomfortable and maybe religiously not able to accept hugs. There is no criterion of correctness. It's about what works for me to support me in feeling the emotions that are going to help me have better relationships, greater well-being, and achieve my goals and dreams in life. That's what we have to help children develop. There's no specific strategy. It's what works for me in this context. The impact on this, though, is pretty darn good. Here's what we know from our research. Our children with more developed emotional intelligence look like the column on the left. Our children with, um, I mean the column on the right. Our children with less developed skills look like the column on the left. So I ask you, if you have children, which column do you hope for for them? If you're a teacher, which column do you hope for? Here's what we know about teachers with these skills. How many of you would like to have these outcomes? More sensitivity, more effective, higher performance ratings, less stress and burnout. We know that these skills are predictive of critical outcomes for our teaching force as well. And now a new study that we just did. Look at this. We did a study where we looked at the principles of emotional intelligence. And remember I said all the teachers were frustrated? Well, I lied. The ones who are the most frustrated are the ones who work in schools where their principals have low emotional intelligence. So, this is not about children. This is not about just teachers. This is about the entire system has to be emotionally intelligent. Because let me tell you, if you work for someone who has low emotional intelligence, it is difficult. Because they're just not regulated. And no one wants to be around someone who's dysregulated all the time. And guess what? Your workload is no different, but your exhaustion levels are significantly lower. Your burnout levels are lower when you work in a school with a principal with higher emotional intelligence. Your intentions to leave the teaching profession are significantly lower when you work in a school with a principal with high emotional intelligence. And your job satisfaction is much higher. So not only do we need social and emotional learning for our kiddos, but we need it for our teacher's O's and our <laughs> leader's O's. Now, what I want to talk with you about for the last 15 minutes that I have with you is I've been troubled with some of the data and some of the conversation around social emotional learning. And I'll tell you why. Because a lot of people only want to see this in service of academics. Now, I'm an academic. I believe in grade point average as, a, as something that's important. I believe learning is more important than grade point average, of course. But these skills are critical for their own right. We have to start thinking that this is an area of our social and emotional life that has to be addressed for its own sake. Because I don't know about you, but I'll give you an example. I work at an institution where leaders in my institution, like department chairs, don't necessarily believe in these skills. I gave a talk for a surgery department at my university. At the end of my talk, this chief surgeon, big personality, he looked at me and he goes, what happened to Yale? And I was like, okay. And he goes, Mark, this is Yale. We produce Nobel laureates, not nice people. <laughs> I was like, I couldn't believe this happened. And then I said, does anybody else, does anybody else have a different perspective? Uh, and another guy said, he goes, you know what I learned, Mark? Sometimes you gotta be a blank hole because then people just shut up and do what you tell them to do. I literally looked over at the chair of this department. And I said, are we making a documentary here? Like, <laughs> Is this like a test or something? Like, I don't know what the heck is happening here. And he, got, he almost looked like he was going to cry. And he said to me, Mark, why do you think I brought you in? Because his department is crumbling. Nobody gets along. Nobody wants to work for these people. Think about the mindset of that person who speaks that way. 
How many of you feel like you could trust someone like that? No way. So I spent the last 25 years of my life thinking about implementation because I am the anti-SEL kit guy. And I am the anti-bullying kit guy because there's very little data to support that those have influence over children's and adults' lives. And what I'm here to do is to try to convince you to move away from having too many rules and too many assemblies and too many kits and too many flavors of the months and simple lessons to think systemically. And let me give you a little theory of change, which I appreciate. When we were building our approach, I learned early on, and I can tell you endless stories. I was blessed in life to have an uncle who gave me, as I like to say, the permission to feel. I didn't have the easiest home life. I didn't have the easiest school life, but I had an uncle who was a middle school teacher in upstate New York who asked me a very provocative question when I was in middle school. He said, Mark, how are you feeling? And then he didn't say anything else. He just paused and he listened. And when I shared with him, he didn't judge. He said, wow, I didn't know that. What can we do together to support you? And that changed my life forever to the point that when I graduated from college, I pulled my uncle out of retirement and asked him to collaborate with me to write our first curriculum. And then we went around and we tried to convince people to do this work, our middle school program we had developed, and we failed. We failed because this is what I heard. My job is not to talk to students about my failings. Endless things that I'll do joy, jolly, cheerful, but I am not talking about anxiety or despair or any negative emotions. <clears throat> I said, but like, they're experiencing all these unpleasant feelings. We're just not gonna talk about them? Like, they're feeling them, so why don't we talk about them? No, I'm not comfortable doing that. I don't want to do that. So quickly what I learned is that if you want to do this work well, it's about adult development, not about child development. The kids love it. But we have to have the adults who are emotionally skilled teaching them. Because if you don't have the vocabulary as the educator, and if you don't have the strategies to be the role model, it's just never going to have any credibility. That's why the leaders have to be trained. So we started with kids and we ended up realizing it has to be systemic. It's got to be administration, educator staff, and families and students. There are four things that I think that we need to focus on. Well, with whatever approach you're adopting, mine or others, you've got to figure out the mindset piece. Are people on that bus? Do they value and believe that emotions matter? The second, are they really developing their own skills on a continuous basis? I'm going to be 50 in a few weeks. I'm still developing my skills. If you would have seen me after I had, I, I was traveling for a few weeks, I came home, I was a mess. My mother-in-law was with me. She likes to watch loud TV at night. I don't like TV. It was a nightmare in my home. I'm telling you, I was the most dysregulated person. I was like, Mark, take your breath. Mark, be your best self. <laughs> and I'm like, here I am, the director of the freaking Center for Emotional Intelligence. And I can't do this. <laughs> it's hard. In our schools, we have to have healthier climates. We have to focus on the social and emotional climate. And if we don't have policies and practices that are aligned, it's never going to have sustainability. And what research shows that when you do it this way, pretty great things happen, as you can see from those outcomes on that right side. There are tools that we built. One tool is let's get rid of our rules completely. Like, rules are good for compliance. But why not? Why not ask? just like we asked our nation's teachers. Why not ask every teacher in every school? Why not ask every student in every school? How do you want to feel as a student in this school? And then why don't we have them co-create the environments where they'll feel that way? So that there is shared accountability for ensuring that people are actually experiencing the emotions that they themselves said they want to have. I had the most amazing experience in Seattle Public Schools recently. The whole district has adopted our work, and I went to visit a fourth grade classroom, and they have their emotional intelligence charter. And I saw a word, and the word was selfless. I was, I was like, selfless? I didn't know that word until I was like 40. And so I didn't believe it. I went to this kid, I said, hey, you, selfless? Like, how did you come up with that you guys want to feel selfless this year? And he said, sir, we as a class decided that people are becoming too narcissistic. I was like, okay, not a problem, not a problem. Unbelievable. And they create strategies around being selfless. That's pretty remarkable. 
They're all words, and every environment need, has, it's either spirited or respected or determined or empowered. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's what the people in that environment say they want to feel, because probably they're saying it because they don't feel the opposite. When you feel disrespected, you probably say you want to feel respected. Then you've got to build that vocabulary. So we have our mood meter tool. You go to schools, you'd be blown away by the creativity with which these mood meters have been implemented. From emotion concepts being taught through every grade level, three to four words per year, so that by the, child gets to, by the time a child gets to middle school, they've learned 80 to 90 emotion concepts on how to recognize, understand, and label, and express, and regulate them through storytelling, through character analysis, through teaching those words to their parents, through thinking about evidence-based strategies to regulate them to teach is understanding the role of emotions in learning and decision-making so that we can realize that different emotions are useful for different types of activities in our school, from brainstorming to consensus building to editing to championing in a cause. And you can see here, these are just examples of creative ideas of kids. They make gifts of their family. So instead of having family nights where nobody shows up, don't do it. Just get the kids to make a gift and give it to their families. It doesn't cost anything to make a little mood meter gift for your parent and teach it to them to apps that we built to help people be more self-aware and track their emotions over time, to a quote. I ask everyone here to take a nice inhale and read this quote. Raise your hand if you think you need more space that you notice that at the end of a long day when you're tired and you're hungry and you're irritable, that your sometimes worst self comes out. Anybody feel that way? <laughs> when your resources are depleted, it's hard to be your best self. So we developed a tool that we call the Meta Moment. Everyone, meet your toaster child. <laughs> and what Meta does is he teaches us to be aware of our triggers. By way of example, one of my deepest triggers where I work is entitlement. I grew up in a very poor family. My father was an air conditioning repairman. I didn't grow up you know, with a very educated family. I grew up working hard with my parents. And I work now at a place where people are like, Professor Brackett, um, I've got a question, but I'm not really sure you know the answer. <laughs> I'm like, firstly, who taught you how to use your chin that way? <laughs> and, and secondly, I may not know the answer to your question, but I'm going to grade your freaking paper. <laughs> and, oh, do you have to take a breath? I got to pause. And I got to see my best self. I got to remind myself that I'm dedicated to being the feelings master. And I say, what would a feelings master be able to do in this situation? He'd be a magician. He would pause. He would reflect, he would ask a question instead of going after the child or the adult. It's hard work. You'd be blown away by how powerful it is to just pause to think about your best self before you say or do something. It's a miracle in terms of self-regulation. We have children all over the United States and the world reaching for their best selves that are culturally specific and contextually specific. My best self as a professor, my best self as a presenter, as a brother, as a son, doesn't matter. It's all available to you. We have tools to help with problem solving, especially around conflict, because we're not doing so well with conflict in our nation right now. We're not taking other people's perspectives very seriously. We're not empathizing. At the high school level, it's so important for it to be about the student themselves. They're dying for learning to be more personalized. They want to know who they are. They want to think about where they're going to go in life, and they want to think about what are the skills and strategies I need to achieve my own goals in life. How much time do we spend doing that each day? We've been working with Facebook for a number of years on a tool we call Inspire Ed that's available for free for schools to build more positive school climates, and it helps students be the change makers within their schools to think about what do we need how do we implement it? How do we evaluate it? And how do we iterate to continuously make our school a better place? I'm going to end by telling you this is really hard work. Schools that come to our training say, so we're going to start tomorrow with the kids, right? I'm like, uh-uh. Take a break. First year has got to be about the adults. Don't even think about classroom implementation yet. Just work 
with the faculty and staff to make sure they're all on the bus. Get them involved. Let them think about their emotional vocabulary. What are their beliefs around feelings? What are the skills they use to regulate? What I'll end with is the following. There's good data. We have great data to show that doing this work makes a huge difference in children's lives, in teachers' lives, and also in the climates of our schools. So I'm going to end with two things. One is, unlike your last presenters, my book isn't coming out for another couple weeks. I'm so upset. But I'm going to create a competition in the house. If you'd like to order my book, two things are going to happen. One, you're going to get a signed plate from my publisher. And two, what I'm going to give you is a free presentation like I just did for your school. So it's a contest. Um, if you're interested in it, uh, I'm going to give myself to all of you for free. Or a couple of you, I should say. Yeah. Ooh, that sounded good, didn't it? <laughs> all right, it's time for me to wrap up. A few things. First, oh, you want to go back? Sure. It's just permission to feel book dot, uh, at gmail.com. So let me, um, let me end by saying a few things. First, raise your hand if you believe that emotions matter. All right, let me hear the sound that lets me know that emotions matter. Three, two, one. Oh, that was good. I'm coming back here. This is my self-esteem building presentation. Two, everyone in the world likes to think of these skills as being soft skills. They are so wrong. These are the hardest skills to learn in life. And as a matter of fact, they're harder than the hard skills. Because I'll never forget that five minus three is two. But every day, I've got to practice developing my skills for managing my feelings. Three, there are creative ways to do this. I share with you today one approach. Many of you are doing great things already. I hope you'll continue to do them. If you're interested in ours, we're there to help you out. Four, good news. The areas of your brain responsible for learning emotional intelligence are there with, for you today and for the rest of your life. If I were to try to learn, let's say, Chinese right now, my brain would not be able to get the nuance of that language. It's just developmental. But the good news for you in terms of emotional intelligence is that your vocabulary can be built today. You can learn more words to be more granular. And two, you can always practice and develop a better repertoire of emotion management strategies. I will argue until the end of my career that systemic approaches will have better impact than piecemeal approaches. And finally, my hope and prayer. <sighs> Can I ask everyone to just take a nice long inhale? And an exhale. Just take 10 seconds and visualize what might be different for you personally, for your school, and for the kids who you serve if every adult around them took this work seriously. What's different for our children if every adult who surrounds them has these skills and is modeling them and teaching them? So I believe from my heart that this is not a magic pill, but it is a great place to start in terms of building a nation, districts where there are children who are more empathic, where there's more compassion, where there's greater equity, and for me, what's most important is that we give children the skills to achieve their dreams. Thank you so much. So thank you, Mark. You know, I'm thinking sitting there, I'm saying, I'm going to do a mood meter for like when I get home for my husband and myself, you know? He probably lives in the red, and I'm probably the whole rainbow. <laughs> but anyway, um, so your words are inspiring, and the ruler program is something in New York City that, we, as he said, we already use. So as a positive, positive learning tool, and so glad that more teachers now, um, they're implementing it, and they're doing it, as he says, at, at a gradual pace. But also, how, um, how effective it has, it has been in New York City. But I don't know about you, but I am so leaving here supercharged from Randy's inspiring speech calling on educators to be guardians of democracies. Democracy. So who are we? <laughs> We're the guardians of democracy. Let's go. Who are we? 
We need that meter. We need that move meter. <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, to Chris's uh, Edmund's presentation to embrace, to embrace the joy of teaching and spread love through our classrooms. I am seeing a new level of activism. But I wanna thank everyone here today, especially the huge turnout from the New York delegation who came out on Friday to, the noon, to protest at noon at the US Customs and Border Control Office, and for each and every one of you that attended the Lights of Liberty Vigil. Both events focused on advocacy to end the Trump's administration inhumane, I don't hear you clapping. Trump's administration inhumane policy of detention centers and family separation. We must keep this activism going when we return to our communities and our classrooms. We can no longer be spectators and watch silently from the sidelines. We need to be activists. Throughout the school year, we want you to keep hearing, we want to keep hearing from you and seeing how you are putting this enthusiasm into action. If you take part in a town hall, in a rally, in a political action, make sure to post your pictures using hashtag AFT votes or hashtag I am AFT. So let's celebrate our activism. Celebramos nuestro activi activi activimos, activimos and thank you, and have safe travels. The conference is now finished. Let's get loud, let's get active, y gracias por estar aquí en Teach 19. Buen viaje.